Good morning. Uh, I'm Sabrina Phillips um, from Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. Um, we're going to have our first session with uh, shunt lesions, and I, I think it will be enjoyable, but I do have a disclosure. I've had a meltdown of my uh, slides uh, in terms of the movies, so my heart was beating really fast when I answered that question. It wasn't just beating, it was beating fast, so um, we could get... All right, well, we're gonna break this morning session up into pre-tricuspid valve shunts, um, post-tricuspid valve shunts, and then we're gonna have a little special topic on AV canal defects um, to really round out what I think is a, a good overview of the shunt lesion. So I'm gonna start with the pre-tricuspid shunts, and that includes atrial septal defects, um, partial anomalous venous return. So I have no disclosures. So atrial septal defects are a really important defect to consider when we're thinking about the adult with congenital heart disease because this is actually the second most common congenital heart defect that's recognized for the first time in adulthood, meaning that you can escape childhood without this diagnosis but have a pretty significant lesion. And the reasons are that the symptoms are quite progressive and subtle, and the physical exam findings, so we like to answer our board questions really quickly about about what the findings are, they're actually really quite hard to sort out in the exam room. Uh, and you can imagine that hearing a fixed split of the second heart sounds not so easy in a five-year-old who's scroll scrolling around on the exam table and making noise. So that's why ASDs are often first diagnosed in adulthood. Now the atrial septum is a really complicated embryologic structure, and we'll get into all the different types of defects, but in general, they all share a common, all all the different types of defect have some common physical exam features. And if the RV is volume and or later could be pressure overloaded, you may fill an RV lift. So when you place your hand in the patient's chest, you can feel an RV impulse. You can hear a soft systolic murmur, and that's because of extra blood going out the lung artery, out the pulmonary valve. That's pulmonary outflow murmur. That's not the sound of flow across the defect itself. The second heart sound can be fixed, meaning that we hear the pulmonary component late with no variation with respiration. Occasionally, as our adult patients have had a lot of volume loading over the years from their shunt, from their ASD, their right heart will dilate and they can get secondary tricuspid valve regurgitation. So if your ears are really good, you may hear that. Now, while it's reported in all kinds of textbook and board exam questions about diastolic rumbles related to increased flow back across the tricuspid valve, I would challenge you to hear that. The tricuspid valve orifice is huge, and you would need probably about uh, three times the amount of pulmonary blood flow as systemic flow to start to hear a rumble in a thin patient with a good exam. So as I said, there's many types of ASDs. This is not one type of condition, and this is because the atrial septum is really complicated embryologically in how it forms. There's a lot of things coming together and a lot of connections being made. And everywhere we're supposed to build a wall or make a connection, we could have a defect occur. So there are four types of atrial septal defects, and they all have a slightly different features. But the secundum defect, which is the most common we'll spend a lot of time on, the primum defect, the sinus venosus, and the unroofed coronary sinus. And this is the order of how common they are. So let's take a look uh, first at how we're going to diagnose any of these ASDs. And really, currently, echocardiography is the gold standard for diagnosis and for assessment of treatment. Because with echo, both transthoracic and transesophageal, we can tell you what type of defect it is, where it is. We can tell you what's the consequence of this hemodynamic load, this shunt. Is the right heart dilated? Is it dysfunctional? About 5% of patients with ASD over time will get elevation of pulmonary pressures, and we can estimate those pretty reliably with echo. We can look at secondary problems like tricuspid regurgitation, and then we know that congenital heart disease often travels in packs, so we can look for other um, conditions like pulmonary stenosis, mitral valve lesions, things like that. And then we can usually tell our patient and our colleagues what we think the repair options are. In general terms, we don't usually need a lot of other imaging. We may supplement this with CT imaging to look at pulmonary venous return if we're having some concern about that in certain uh, locations, but rarely would we need to go to the cath lab. 
So let's start with the secundum atrial septal defect. This is the most common ASD. About 75% of ASDs will be of this type. This is a defect right in the center of the atrial septum. It's really the only true atrial septal defect, meaning that all of the borders are atrial septal tissue. And so this defect um, is quite unique in that uh, the, uh, manner. Like all ASDs, the ratio of the shunt, how much blood's going to move from the left heart to the right heart, is a diastolic phenomenon. It's related mainly to the end diastolic pressure difference between the right heart and the left heart. That's important to recognize because uh, you can have some right to left shunting in certain circumstances when patients don't have elevated right heart systolic pressures. So diastolic pressures are the key. And then this is associated, of course, most people have left to right shunting and the right atrium, right ventricle is volume loaded, so it's gonna be dilated. So here's what a chest X-ray would look like for a patient with a secundum ASD. This is one of my uh, younger uh, patients. You can see that the heart is a bit generous here. We had a nice rounded border looking like right heart dilatation, and the pulmonary arteries look over-circulated and a bit dilated. So this is pretty classic. It's not, not a wild finding on X-ray. They're pretty subtle. On EKG, we tend to have, for most defects except one, which we'll get into, we tend to have right axis deviation with right bundle branch block pattern. This is one unique feature that I want to bring to your attention for um, secundum ASDs is this little notch right here I've blown up lead two uh, and lead three. And you can see this little uh, indent at the peak of, oops, of the... Um, QRS, and that's called uh, crochetage. It means knitting needle. And this is actually seen quite commonly in patients with secundum ASDs and can be seen in other defects. So a little hint uh, on the EKG. Now, this is where my slides melted down, and I'm feeling a little stressed. I was going to show you really cool echo pictures, but this is what they look like. So uh, I guess that they're in the witness protection program or something. So I have no cool echo pictures to show you, unfortunately. Um, um, but echo is the gold standard. So what do we do with the secundum ASD? Well, we would recommend closure if there's evidence of a significant shunt. If the RV is dilated, uh, we need to close this. We don't have to go calculate QP, QS. And this is the only atrial septal defect that is possibly amenable to transcatheter closure with a device because it has that rim of atrial septal tissue. All the other defects you'll see aren't amenable to transcatheter closure for the most part um, because of their um, territory, their borders. Surgical closure would be recommended in large defects that you can't fit a device into or if you have a secondary problem that you need to take care of. So if you see an adult with more than moderate tricuspid valve regurgitation, you need to consider whether the right heart is really going to remodel after closure and improve that um, tricuspid regurgitation. If you think, I usually say if you're 30, 40 years old and you have severe TR, you're probably not going to remodel that and you need to take care of the TR as well to get rid of the volume load. So that's a case where I would take a patient who I might have closed with a, a device but then closed them surgically. So here the, there's lots of uh, closure devices, and I'm certainly not the expert, but we do have uh, a couple experts sitting down here uh, who may show you these devices later. But there are a lot of nice percutaneous options available for ASD, not so much for VSD, and um, we can talk about that later. So let's look at the next most common type of ASD. This is the primum ASD. Uh, this is a defect down here at the crux of the heart where a lot of action is happening for valve formation and, and closure of the AV septum. This defect does not have a border that's all atrial septum. It has some border that is AV valve. And the AV valves are malformed in this condition, both the mitral and the tricuspid valve. So this is a pretty unique defect. And so in primum, ASD is about 10% of all ASDs. The most common association we think about with AV valve dysfunction is the cleft mitral valve. The cleft means like the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve looks like someone took a pair of scissors and cut a piece of pie shape out of it, and it makes the mitral valve regurgitant. So this patient may have a slightly different physical exam in addition to the things we talked about with in general ASDs and right heart uh, overload. You may now hear a really loud mitral 
mitral regurgitation murmur. They may have some features that looks like their left atrium is dilated on chest x-ray or on other um, imaging tools. We can see other mitral valve pathology, including a double orifice mitral valve, which had a great picture, but you're not going to get to see it. And then the AV valves, this, this, this ASD is really easily diagnosed on transthoracic echo for the most part because instead of the tricuspid valve, normally we see it offset towards the apex when we're looking at a four-chamber view of the heart. Now the tricuspid and the mitral are setting right at the same level. So that really picks up your attention uh, and you don't tend to miss this defect. This is in the spectrum of AV canal defect, but you're going to hear a lot more about that later. So this one also has a different EKG pattern. These guys have left axis deviation instead of right axis deviation. It's because they have some changes in um, how the electrical conduction system is. They do tend to have the RSR prime. They may have AV block and left atrial enlargement. So here's just a Thankfully, this still framework. So you can see here that the AV valves are actually at the same level. The other thing to remember is these patients have an elongated LV outflow tract. They can have cortical attachments from the left AV valve to the septum, and they can get outflow obstruction, which is different than other ASDs. So keep that in mind. So treatment of this is only surgical, no transcatheter stuff. And you do need to address the valve lesions. Otherwise, you're going to be bringing these guys back to the operating room. So we're kind of getting a tight here on time. So sinus venosis defects are pretty rare. They tend to, they're defects where the KV join um, the right atrium. They're only about 5% of ASDs. And the big thing to remember with this is virtually all of these patients have anomalous pulmonary venous return as well. And so that needs to be considered. And it's not very well seen on transthoracic imaging. We most often have to go to TE imaging because this is clearly how you would diagnose it. Um, <laughs> so we are looking for those right uh, anomalous veins on T as well. So again, the treatment is surgical only, except in rare can, cases where someone like Dr. Lin can come up with a transcatheter approach, but we don't recommend that for everybody, and you have to redirect your pulmonary veins. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Just want you to know there is such a thing as an unroofed coronary sinus or a coronary sinus ASD. This does still act like a left to right shunt uh, for the most part, but these patients can shunt right to left with exercise. And the hallmark is a big coronary sinus with not complete borders. Now, this is a beautiful example of that. You see the coronary sinus back here and no border there. So this is surgical treatment only. Now, this one's going to play for some reason. So if you give a bubble study and they have a left superior vena cava, this is what it looks like. So that's one way to do it. They don't all have left superior vena cavas, though. OK. So we got two minutes left here to talk about the other pretricuspid shunt, and that's partial anomalous pulmonary venous return or connection. Now there are pathologists who like to get really into the linguistics of this and say that connection is the right way to say this, but we can call it PAPVR if we'd like. So there are lots of variants. You can imagine this is a pretty diverse group of conditions, but right pulmonary venous anomalies, meaning one or more of the right pulmonary veins draining to the spot they're not supposed to are the most common when you take in all comers because they're associated with the or sinus venosis ASD. But if you take isolated partial anomalous veins, meaning I don't have an ASD, I just have a wrong connection of my pulmonary veins, actually left veins are a little more common, but that's only about 4% of all comers. So scimitar syndrome gets a lot of play um, because it's got some cool findings, but that's pretty rare, about 3% of all uh, types of partial anomalous veins. And you can get connections everywhere, not just to the SVC, not just to a vertical vein, but to the CS is extremely rare. Embryologically, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have partial bilateral anomalous veins, though we have all seen them. Uh, we would, it's hard to explain why that is. It really should be unilateral when you think of the embryology. So the physiology is a lot like an ASD. It's a left to right shunt, gives you right heart uh, overload. And usually a single vein draining a small segment is not going to cause too much hemodynamic compromise and certainly may not then present until adulthood. Patient may be picked up incidentally. They have a car accident. They get a CT scan, and there you see it. So in uh, usually less than 50% shunt, you're not going to be seen in childhood. 
Echo is good, but we usually need other modalities like CT, MRI, uh, but we can certainly uh, find some things with echo. So just a reminder, what we're looking for in left partial veins is this vertical vein. So the left veins drain into a vein that goes up to the anominate over to the SVC. So we're mixing into the blue blood side. And so <laughs> right upper vein to the SVC is really common, especially with sinus venosis defects. And then scimitar syndrome. Here's what we really use to diagnose that. Here's an MRA showing uh, pulmonary veins draining below the diaphragm to uh, an IBC connection. We can also, if we're really lucky, have a beautiful suprasternal notch view where we're looking with echo right here, and we can pick up even an adult's anomalous veins because we don't see them return where they're supposed to. But that's the exception, not the rule. All right, well, I appreciate your time for this. My time is uh, running out, um, and I hope that's a good start to the shunt, even though we had a lot of uh, AV difficulties that were all on me. Thank you.